end of the hour. Okay. Or 30 minutes. 30 minutes? No, oh, well, so what do an I do? hour. So what do I do with the 25 other minutes? <laughs> I almost said a bad joke about five minutes jobs. Um, I'm going to do a quick introduction into IBM Blue Mix. That's um, IBM's play on software as a uh, uh, platform as a service. You know, all this wonderful confusion. Um, so <coughs> marriage as a service, software as a service, uh, <laughs> business process as a service, also called BS as a service. No? Um, infrastructure as a service and platform as a service. Just to clarify the whole thing, like say infrastructure as a service is your server not sitting in your basement anymore. Platform as a service is your, is your server with the admin tied to it not sitting in your basement anymore. Um, and <coughs> IBM is entered that market very, very late. So we started only last year in July uh, with the official availability. Uh, we don't have the Singapore data center up and running. That's coming somewhere this year. Uh, we do have it's my job to push for it. So yeah, if but pitch with him. Uh, we, we currently have uh, the the platform as a service uh, running in in Texas as well as in uh, in London and uh, to be scheduled up and up and running is Melbourne and Singapore. Um, the big thing is so what you see there is just, that's the web UI. There's a command line as well. Uh, we do Cloud Foundry, so we decided not to invent the uh, reinvent the wheel because. We, we got the patent for the wheel anyway. IBM is old enough. Um, and we also have containers. So, so we're not allowed to say Docker, but this is basically <laughs> IBM's version of Docker. One of the things what we, what we did beyond what uh, standard Docker does is like say, you check in your definition in a version control system and the backend builder builds your Docker image for you, including a vulnerability scan and said, oh, no, you haven't patched it properly, I won't deploy it for you. And then the other thing is, like, say, if you uh, have to uh, run a virtual machine because you want to have some of this funny operating system like Windows or so, um, or BSD. <coughs> so what I'm going to show you quickly, like, say, what, what the whole platform is about. Um, I, I'm pretty empty. I just have one IoT demo, which I'm going to use later. Uh, it uses a cloud and database. That's a NoSQL database, also known as Apache CouchDB. And I have not any other stuff. So when I want to create an application, this is really complicated. I say, oops. I say, create an application. And then it asks me, hey, what do you want to do, web or mobile? Huh? I don't understand mobile, so I do web. And then it says, OK, pick your poison. So we currently have from Java, Node.js, Go, PHP, Python, Ruby, ASP. Um, and that's a nice little thing is, uh, if you have a build pack, heritage of Cloud Foundry, you can deploy your build pack. My favorite build pack is the null build pack. <laughs> the null build pack doesn't do anything, but it just copies the file you have. For instance, you have Linux binaries, you can use a null build pack to run it on Bluemix as well. Okay, um, I will refuse to do PHP. Pick your language. <laughs> Potentially hazardous programming, PHP. Uh, Python, okay. So I said I want to do Python. And then it says a Python application gets you up and running quickly and blah, blah, blah. There is one interesting thing is down here, 375 gigabyte hours free each month. Last time I checked in the manual of physics, there is no such thing as a gigabyte hour. Patent pending IBM, we invented a new physics measurement. This is size of the runtime times hours run. And if you're really good in math, who's good in math? So, okay, so that's basically a 5.2 runtime or two. 256 runtimes a whole month free of charge every month. Other than our friendly competitor, the big one with the A, no? uh, we don't charge any network. So there is no network transfer. There's only like say runtime for the runtime, storage for the storage, and API calls for the APIs, depending what you use. Okay, so we use gonna use Python. So then it asks me how do you want to name your application? I already was a nice boy and I pre-configured a few domains for myself. Usually you start with mybluemix.net and then you compete with everybody else what the application's name is going to be. This is why I use Dragon Tamer. Uh, my boys are born in the, rain, in the year of the dragon, so this is why Dragon Tamer. Uh, how should I call it? Mm. Come on. This is, I Ralph. need to ask you, huh? Ralph. Ralph? Okay, Ralph. 
I paid him for that. <laughs> <laughs> nope, they are Ernest and Anthony. So and I say finish, and that very moment, uh, a Cloud Foundry build kick script kicks off in the background, and uh, if I'm very lucky, the application <laughs> will actually run, which usually it does. So and then it says, okay, what are the two options you have? Yeah, since it's a Python application, it doesn't offer you Eclipse, because real Python developer use what IDE? Notepad, command Python. line, huh? Whatever. Python. We are, yeah, that's good. <laughs> huh? We are is less painful, no, it's as painful as poking yourself in the eye. <laughs> <laughs> if you know the colon, you know how to get out. Colon, cool. <laughs> That's all I ever learned. Okay, so we have two ways. So, so we have the command line interface. No, it's, it's all the CF commands, I'm going to show that in a second. And my personal favorite, we have a full Git integration. Okay, so when I look, go in the overview, and the overview now says that you have one instance of Python running. It has one to eight uh, 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 meg of memory. Python is actually quite fr frugal compared to the other languages. So, excellent choice. <laughs> <laughs> and it says, uh, your application, Ralph, is now running. It tells me here the, the route, Ralph Dragon Tamer. I have the uh, activity log. And down here I can say, estimate the cost of the application. Um, I come back to that in a, in a second, and up here is a add a git repository. I said, okay, add a git repository. IBM runs as part of the Bluemix environment under the name hub.jest.net, a full-fledged git server with a few little extras, and that's the build and deploy capability. And it says, okay, you want to do a git repository? And said, oh yeah, I love a git repository. I click, okay, continue, and bang, off it goes, and create copy C. Just before this step, yeah. What did we have? Did we have a Django framework, or did we just have a Python interpreter? Just we gonna look. This is why I copied in in the in the Git repository. We're gonna have a look at the source. What it just did right now. Okay. If you have something ready-made code, you can use it as uh, as well. well. Before you copied from Git, uh, what, do we have anything? Uh, there is. Yeah. yeah well, okay. So let me just show you the running <coughs> application. Ralph Dragon Tamer and that's the Hello World one. Let me open that up. That was a copy to Git, not from Git, right? To Git, to Git. Yeah. So the, that's the basically the Hello World, Hello World application. There's, to my best knowledge, no framework in there. We do have boilerplates with Django. Okay. I, I got cover the boilerplates in a few minutes. Um, okay, so now I go back to my dashboard. I have now the Git URL and straight away the ability to, to edit code. So since I'm supposed to speak faster, this is how the, the repository looks like. Huh? So it should, I, I, okay, I need to reload that, otherwise it doesn't show it up. So these are all the, the applications I have in there. I can then invite different people to, to participate. And where is, where is it, Ralph? So, that, there you go, yeah. <laughs> And one of the things is, let's say, what we did, let's say, when you, when you look at standard Git, it's just version control. What we, were, what we added is the, does it run? Yeah. Is the, uh, one of the things, track and plan, that's a little bit like our little bug tracker. And then my, my little favorite one is build and deploy. I'm going to show you that in a second. And here I can say edit code. So we use the Eclipse Orion project, which is a browser-based editor. I'm not sure who would do that in his right mind. Well, I say, if you are in need, you're somewhere, and you bloody need to fix that two lines of bug, what you found, you can anyway go in there, and it will actually check out uh, the complete repository. There's no live editing of some, some code involved. And then build and deploy. Let me just show you that quickly. And there you see there's just a server pie, so there's not much. In. So we have build into a build stage and a deploy stage and you can add a test stage where I said once I stuff something into a git URL typically the master branch go run the build if the build was uh, successful deploy that and then uh, for for the build we sub uh, let me just go for you to the to the thingy configure the stage and it says okay where does my input come from I said, okay, it comes from the repository. Uh, this is the URL where it came from. 
when anything goes into the branch master please trigger the the build and then for the jobs what I what you can see okay what are the builder types and that's the interesting part so we have basically the who's who of building and Gradle grunt maven npm or shell script and then what I mentioned earlier the container service to build a um, a docker container in the background so you you check in your docker definition in let's say uh, this would be a, then a, a Docker project. You check in your mm -hmm. Docker definition in the version control, and it gets built and deployed in the background. You don't need to wait. So these are the, the capabilities. So what, whatever you fancy is there. Like say, there's always shell script if <laughs> if nothing fails. Okay, and that makes things very very easy. So you happily deploy it, ch check it into the respective branch, and you push it out. You also can have different build stages. As you said, if I uh, check into the dev branch, please deploy to the dev space. If I check into the master branch, please deploy to the production stage. So, <clears throat> but the, the real fun is, um, that's our hello world. Uh, I think you believe me if I would edit the source code that it runs. Let's go to the ba back to the dashboard. Uh, a Python server that runs and does nothing is not a good Python server. So you need services or APIs and this is where the strengths of Bluemix comes into play. So all the Cloud Foundry based uh, uh, implementations, so you got OpenShift from Red Hat running on AWS, you got uh, Hadoku from Salesforce, um, a few smaller ones, I always forget them. No? Hadoop. No? Hadoop. Hadoop is not, an open, it's not open uh, Cloud Foundry. Okay, so I, <coughs> I'm in my application, Ralph, and it says, what would you like? And then you have here the categories and the level of support. Is it an IBM supported one, a community one? <coughs> is it still better or is it third party? <coughs> and then the first one, of course, well, we're very proud of is like, say, um, the Watson, the cognitive uh, computing. I call it the teenage computing. You ask a question, you get an ambiguous an answer. Huh? I asked my boys something, have you done your homework? Uh, Daddy, what exactly do you mean homework? <laughs> <laughs> something, what I like say, there is, when you Google Watson personality uh, insights, what you should not do is load the personality insight, remove the sample text, and then, like I say, stand in stage in KL and paste Mr. Najib's last speech in there. It's not good. Luckily, an AI cannot be sued for libel. Uh, okay, so you get all these funny things. Is I like trade-off analytics quite nicely. No? This takes away the necessity to make your own head. Why you buy this phone or that phone? Um, I, there is one hard-coded. No? So there is a soccer game or a romantic movie you want to go with your spouse. It will tell you you go to the romantic movie. One of the interesting things that, that we were discussing about for trade-off analysis that's really for Singaporeans is housing HDB. Right. So one of the things that I was, uh, I'm probably going to play around with is to create a demo on how to get all the different parameters for your HDB housing and essentially based on your parameters, which HDB house or which condo, a estate, which condo, land and housing, right? Yeah. anything, right? So, so that's something that trade-off analytics can actually help. Yeah, it goes beyond got money, need condo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, then what is pretty... Uh, the more interesting thing is, like say, for, for mobile services, we got the push notifications, the, um, you know, iOS 8 had it a bit special because you have the, the push notifications that are actionable, so the, the API got different. Twilio is a third-party service that le lets you send spam, no, <laughs> SMS. Why did I say spam MS? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and my personal one, uh, uh, what I like, is mobile QA um, that allows you that, <coughs> that logs for you which of the APIs were called, what, what, what happened in your application. You can have like say a module, you shake your phone and, and give a feedback straight away to the user. And little secret one, you can use it as a mini app store bypassing the whole uh, public process. So for 50 odd users. Um, little DevOps, also one of my little favorite, auto scaling. Your, your application is popular between 11 and one not before, not after. So before and after you run one instance and between 11 and one, once the demand picks up, you start new instances. And since we only bill you for running instances, you can tailor the bill towards to what actually is the consumption. Well, that's my, uh, so this is one of my little favorites. And then you see there's a quite a bit of 
uh, third party New Relic is quite uh, and Blaze Meter, they are quite popular in, in terms of monitoring and load. Uh, web and application uh, from MQLite to session cast to workflow, the scheduler, they can say some tasks one, once every two hours, a, a, each third of the month, basically what you can good in, do in a good tron, a cron task, you can schedule there. Then we have a lot of third party there from memcache to uh, the geocoding from Pitney Bowes. I haven't checked how good they are in Asia. Um, um, for geocoding? <coughs> for geocoding? Yeah. No. No. Nope. Okay, great. I, I, was, I was guess that, guessing that. Uh, SendGrid for sending out all your spams. Um, session cache, that's quite a bit of a thing. When you start developing cloud base, no? um, this is probably not relevant for you guys because you're cloud born, but I say I see it from an enterprise developer. They're so used, I have this monster big web server. And then I use a singleton to tr keep track of all the sessions. But when you have multiple instances, all that doesn't work anymore. So you need to have a service that keeps your, your sessions alive because you never know where the user's gonna hit. No? It's almost like Kung Fu, you never know where you get hit. Um, <coughs> okay, so and down there integration. This is one of the things where we are pretty uh, pretty strong is for cloud integration, CQ gate and API management. API management is my current favorite because um, my boss wants, me, wants it to be my favorite. Um, this is a layer between your application and your clients where you can throttle, measure um, and bill your API usage. No? Especially like say our enterprise customers are very fond of that. They said, hey, hey, what is if suddenly I have 10,000 requests per second, my backend can't handle them. I said, don't worry, we put the API management in front and said, the open API can be called 10 times a second, not more. You're paying customers, they can call it 1,000 times more, and your super special customers, they run in their own hardware, so you can define what they're gonna do. And you get nice little graphics, which application with which key, and all that stuff called it. You know, you coded all your REST APIs to properly do application keys and all this stuff. No, you haven't. API management puts that layer on top of you and you just need to do, uh, if it's a REST call, you're good. And then <coughs> data management, uh, starting from an SQL database, which I find very amusing. They didn't dare to, to call it what it is, a DB2. Uh, <laughs> Then we got Cloud and NoSQL, my little favorite, because like I said, I know Damien cuts. Damien, Damien works for Salesforce now. Um, Budget crazy ex-IBM, he wrote uh, uh, cloud, um, um, Apache CouchDB in Erlangen. Huh? Not Erlangen, that's a, that's a city in Germany, in Erlangen, and if you write Erlangen, you need to be crazy. But it runs. <laughs> okay, then we got uh, MongoLab, that's quite popular, then Elephant, Elephant SQL, and ClearDB. So that's, so we basically have all the, all the bases covered. And then big data. So f for somebody who likes it, pretends to know uh, something <coughs> about data, DashDB is pretty cool. Um, that is a uh, database for analytics, works nicely with R, or big insight, no? We say, if you can lift your data, it's not big data. Time series database, the artist formerly known as Informix. Insights for Twitter, that's kind of a, um, a mix, because it's data storage and it links out to, to Twitter straight away. Then got a bit of security and business analytics and Internet of Things and custom, oh, and Wait, this one, uh, I built that? myself. I built oh, myself. Okay. That's for one of the, that's, that's uh, with the API management. So I b define in the API management, I define a constraint and it surfaces back into Bluemix. Okay, but, <coughs> Database. Let's add the database. I said, okay, I want a database. And it tells me, okay, uh, you want to be in the space development. You want to do it for the application Ralph. It gets a fancy name. And it tells me 20 gig is free per month and 500,000 uh, reads and 100,000 writes, more or less. After that, 1,000 calls is 3 cents, roughly, US. I said create, bang, it, the whole thing creates and uh, adds it to my project. So and then the, the big question is, yeah, and how do I then get to that database using Python? Um, and he said, okay, I add something, you want to restage? I said, okay, restage it. And now I see here, down here, environment variables. 
There's a wonderful environmental, environmental variable called VCAP services. And there, you can read that, that's the JSON string. It tells you where is, where is the host, what's the URL to get there, what's your username, what's your password. So you shouldn't show that, flash that on screen. You're gonna, gonna delete this application after the show, so it doesn't really matter. Right. You read that into Python, how to do that, I don't know. I don't speak Python. At least I pretend I don't do. <laughs> <laughs> and then it's it, under um, environment variables, so you can yeah. actually get it from uh, the same way as you would get uh, from any Python uh, uh, script. Yep. Just yeah. environment variables. Uh, by the way, it, um, yeah, it's under. Uh, yeah. If I'm not wrong, it's vcap underscore something. Yeah. yeah. If you if you read the thing, oh, there vcap we go. services. It's vcap underscore services. There we go. <laughs> that environment. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let, let's have a quick look at the cloud and database. Um, I could actually steal the URL straight away. Should I? Ah, steal. So the, the cloud <coughs> database runs on a um, on a, on its own infrastructure, and allows me to. Does it? Okay. Yeah, looking up just the, the um, and then allows me to go and have basically JSON documents as I as I deem fit with a nice little map reduce mechanism to get to the data oh. and we have an internal server error how <laughs> so how so sweet okay never mind like say but uh, you know TV kitchen here's the cloud, here's the cloud and database <laughs> this is actually if you look very carefully runs on localhost huh? so I can go and have it on my machine, it replicates, uh, <coughs> sorry, synchronizes with any one of it. My little favorite feature, uh, where's my Russian friend? This, this one, um, runs on a Raspberry Pi as well. So we did a project where we used a, a bunch of sensors locally deployed, uh, sending the data to a Raspberry, stuffing it in a, in a couch database, and then synchronizing it back to the, to the cloud. So uh, we, we then can go and do all the analysis in the cloud so everybody can see that, but I don't have, need a permanent connection. And then when you look into that, like say, um, let me just open one of them. Let, let me show you the, including the documents. And you see it's pretty straightforward, a JSON document. It, the, the funny thing is you need to have ID and ref is mandatory. Uh, that's what they use for, for conflict rep, uh, resolution when synchronizing. And then you can have, it could be whatever. This one is quite interesting. This is a design, you see underscore design. This is a map, uh, a map function. I said, give me all documents where the document type is questionnaire. Huh? So this is, let me just show you. I have a view by ID. And that is by, no? Up. No? I did query, okay. I, oh, I, I don't have queries inside, sorry. Uh, but that's, that's basically what in the, what's in that design. Come here. What's in that design in there. That query option, let me show that again. Into the question. The yeah? When do we get to the IoT stuff? We get to the IoT stuff in about 90 seconds. So rough overview. Um, now the interesting thing is IoT. So I was a bit lazy, so let me close this. I created an IoT sensor already. So since my hardware didn't work, curse you, Sparkle. Um, now I have one little sum. So I have an IoT sensor. It's 38 degrees right now, uh, virtually. Uh, oh, 36, 35. And then I have created a application uh, this was the IoT demo. We don't need that. Where's my IoT? There. When I to create this, I just just show you the. Where is it? That was the error. Go back to the. Ah, easy one is. Just go to Google Mix back. That's the fastest. So to create um, what. Or what IBM is using for the IoT cloud is we have a tool that's called Node-RED. It sits on top of Node.js 
escaped out of IBM research. Somehow they must have made the, the IBM legal drunk because they allowed them to publish that under an Apache license. Um, and the, the tool is called, so it's called Node-RED. So when I go to the catalog, um, and then I, uh, I have what we call the boilerplates. This is basically uh, ready-made menus, no? Coke, fries, and a burger. Um, and one of them is the, is the IoT um, so starters. Oh, they not, don't call it boilerplates anymore. They call it starters. Yeah. Yeah, they just deployed a new version last week. Yeah, I know. <coughs> I suffered that. So, <laughs> yeah, the Internet of Things Foundation starter. I click on this. It tells me what it is. And then I can go and set, yeah, credit card months. Hey, I work for you. I don't want that. So it says it's the SDK for Node. It's a cloud and database. And then it's here, Node-RED. Anybody heard about Node-RED already? A little bit? Oh, oh, okay, no. So Node-RED basically looks like this. This is wide open. I haven't uh, uh, closed. Oops, oh, alt, where are we? Here we are. Uh, looks like this. I can go and have a series of elements on the left hand side. I can drag and drop them as I need and connect them to each other. Well, and then when you look at this, uh, you see I have inject is basically just sent uh, sent data in there. Uh, I can connect to MQTT, HTTP, WebSocket, TCP, IP, MQLite, and IBM IoT. Well, and this is I'm going to spend on this a little bit more. And then it said output from debug, HTTP response, uh, functions, I, I run a function, I run a template, uh, I have switch and change and range and what, what have you. I can input, output, email, Twitter, uh, whatever, storage, all the, all the usual suspects. Uh, I have the sentiment analysis. I have all the Watson tools in there. This one you will not find when you when you install your own version of uh, Node-RED. So this is specifically to, to Bluemix. Huh? And then just to make it more fun, for instance, this one is Node-RED running on my local machine. And there I deployed, when you leave it down there, you see light blue bean. This is a little hardware device that talks Bluetooth. And you can say, OK, I run it on a Raspberry Top Pi. I stuff a, a Bluetooth shield on it. And then I can use that to, to interact with this, this type of stuff. But OK, back to our little example. So how do you get the light blue bean uh, extension in Node-RED? Uh, you just um, de define it as a dependency. That's it, in your package, uh, in your package JSON file. OK, so, so uh, what, what dependency is it? Um, light light sure. will be in contribute whatever okay. it's on the light will be in page. But let me show the sample application first. So I go I have the uh, IBM IoT uh, and I said they have one mechanism quick start or the pro proper one with using an API key. I use the quick start. I only need the device ID which I copied already from the from the other one. Of course, to make things a little bit more complicated, hops. Um, we have a bug in the software which requires that the colons go and that the letters are lowercase. Took me two embarrassing shows where it didn't work. <laughs> B and then F. Where does this device ID come from? It's the given to you by no this. Uh, the device ID come, comes from my sensor here. It's basically the MAC address. Yeah, the this MAC here. address. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah with the MAC address, but let's say in the production environment, you use an API key. You don't just use the device address. But this is for, for demo purposes. We all know the, 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 the way to hell is clustered with a demo version. And then I said, OK. And up here, my deploy screen goes up. And I said, OK, deploy this. It then goes and started that, starts that. And now I should be able um, I, to see messages from the device, because then I, I go and said, OK, um, take a function and extract from the payload the temperature. And then I said, OK, based on the temperature, I have a temperature threshold. Where I said, OK, is it below 40, above 40, or is it exactly 42? Well, I have three entry point, uh, exit points. And then I can say, OK, here I have a, a moustache template. Uh, to to output the data, and then I simply 
in this case for demo purposes I simply use a, a, a debug window and then when you look at this oops I played a little bit already and you see temperature 35 within safe limits let's play a little bit 35 sub 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 to 42 I go back to my app application as a one thing is all questions of the universe are answered that's here this one and uh, since I said evaluate every condition it also says temper temperature is critical so I immediately have without great ado if I have a sensor that can connect to the IBM IoT uh, I can use that in Bluemix to process my results now you can say well this is funny uh, a, a virtual sensor is no big deal but I have real sensors how do I do this is there any data size constraints on this transmitted IoT data? Uh, yeah, of course. Like, say, if you want results fast, you should keep your data small. What if it's an M? Uh, what if it's a JPEG picture? Forty <coughs> kilobytes. JPEG. Once need, every minute. If, if your if your network can handle that, it's not a problem. So I, I think. So, but by the way, we have. Um, there's one of the things what you might want to do is you can then pump it into the uh, Alchemy API and it will tell you back which people were on the picture. Alchemy is within this Yes, loop. within yes. Watson. Yeah. Within Watson. Yeah. Yep. Nice. So that, uh, there is also a visual recognition uh, uh, API for Watson, this which is, is another thing yeah. that you can do. My, my, f my favorite example is they have the wonderful big picture of a tiger. Then Watson goes and looks at it very intensively and says, hmm, with a 78 percentage probability, that's a tiger. <laughs> do, do you know, I, I put in my picture in there. Yeah. Huh? Ask Watson, what is this? You know what it said? Girl? I'm a shoe. A shoe? <laughs> <laughs> I'm 78% I'm sure you are a shoe. <laughs> <laughs> Watson, what is this? Girl? I'm a shoe. Shoe? Yeah. 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 On developeribm.com slash IoT or IoT Foundation, the both URLs are same, mm -hmm. there are all the ready recipes for <coughs> IoT devices. Uh, and what, what I u was using was simulated device. But you look, we have the arm and bed, the Intel Galileo. I was in, um, was in Penang last, last Saturday, so I had a little chat with the, uh, with the uh, um, mm -hmm. Intel guys. He just took one out of the box, plugged it in, deployed the library and it just worked. So, which is pretty cool because you can use the device simulator to try something. You can even take, create a, a, a page which emits data, play with it, even if your hardware is not ready, you already can program. Then we have, of course, the, um, the Raspberry Pis, the Arduino Uno, the TI stuff, uh, and, and, and. So what's, what's no cool? Spark. Huh? No spark. Spark is an Arduino. So what's cool about this, right? Like for those people who have been doing like software development and everything, right? Can you imagine that you are just mocking your device first before you even have your device, right? So so pretty much when the si you can simulate and eventually you can actually replace it directly when you have the device already available. So you can do all your testing and everything with a mock hardware device. I think from a software development perspective, it's it's pretty useful. You don't have to build your hardware first and wait for it to be built before you do your software. Um, the other thing is there is a there is a um, there is a Node Red extension for the Spark Core available from directly from what they now called Particle IO. Uh, uh, I got I didn't get my bloody Spark to work, so otherwise I, I would have shown that. Uh, but so basically, these are all the stuff. So when you said uh, this MQTT stuff is okay, but I really don't want to really go into the deep things, you get the ready-made libraries there. Of course, um, another example, you can always, if your device is able to do HTTP get or post, you can connect it to, uh, to the IoT device as well. There is a question here. Uh, well, so I assume that, for example, if you, if you simulate the Raspberry Pi, Mm -hmm. You will have some graphical representation, some way to see the GPIOs and to see the outputs and, um, and the simulator. No, no, it's, 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 it's not. 
Sorry. It's not. <laughs> it's, it's not. A, I say. So what he meant is not that you simulate a Raspberry Pi, right. but I say you you think about building a piece of hardware. You know what it will send out, and you can simulate the signal it show already, okay. not the device itself. Okay. We're okay. not in the business of. So it's just a library that, that will accept the same. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Understood. We we just simulate revenue. Um, okay. How used to say QTT is what you mentioned? Huh? QTT is the protocol. Uh, most likely. Yeah. So I have a question. So. So if I have the actual device, right? So how do I get you the actual device to connect? You say you click know, here and uh -huh. it brings you to the show? download page. Uh. Really? What does it ask you to connect to the Uno? Huh? What does it do if you have the Uno? Uh, there is a there's a small library for that. You just uh, you add it to your project, and then uh, it uh, you need a uh, Uno with network connectivity, also with a okay. with a Wi-Fi shield or network shield. So this library will assist us in transmitting the data. Correct. Into yeah. You is still there any data types that are already predefined? Um, no. Uh, okay. So of course you have str you have strings in there. So it basically, at the end of the day, uh, when you look at MQTT payloads, yeah. most of them are, are string based. But like say, uh, nobody stops you from transmitting binary data. MQTT is is uh, perfectly f capable and of no doing that. On stream, just based on the based on your network capabilities. Mm -hmm. oh. So the the, the picture size of the message in MQTT is up to one hundred twenty five megabytes. One message. One twenty five megabytes. Yes, that's a standard. One message. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. So <laughs> this is there here. <laughs> yeah. SD card Linux image, content to the micro SD card, connect your board, off you go. No? And the, the, the funny thing is the Galileo uses the Arduino IDE. That's quite, I find that quite amusing. Um, okay, so quite quickly back, where is my, oops, no, uh, oh, here we go. Then um, I used another example. This is a, um, a twine. Um, this one, Twine can't do MQTT, Twine only does um, HTTP. So, and you see here, there was, oops, temperature, oh, let, me, let me switch off the simulator data first, go away. So this is, like I said, uh, switching on and off the, 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 debugs, uh, the, uh, the debug. And I got the Twine here, so I shake this a little bit. And eventually, um, yep. you see temperature 25 degrees, uh, orientation was right, and then message a sec rise tuple over. Um, that was like say when I put the twine flat, this is the, the message the, the twine network uh, generates. And when you look here as an example, this is basically simply said, okay, I want to have a post and uh, to the URL uh, slash twine on my IoT demo, and then it will automatically take a s standard HTTP post and transfer that into <coughs> a JSON string for me so I can process it. So that's another example how can I how can connect with an IoT capable device. The libraries that we have, uh, the recipes that in use MQTT, so you use the IBM IoT Cloud. If you fancy to talk to MQTT directly, uh, it's available here as well. HTTP get and post, actually, knows them all, get post, put delete. And then the last one, uh, I installed an extension. So you don't really need to, uh, you don't really need to go through the IoT, IBM IoT platform, no. right? Only if you want to. This is like the advertisement when, when next, next we'll tell you about price and how expensive it is. When, when Daimler-Benz came out with a, with a navigator, they had this wonderful lawn with a the beautiful lady and they said, with the, our navigator, you never have to ask for the way anymore unless you want to. Oh, same with the IoT cloud, unless you want to. Another example, you see down here, I have open weather. So I went in here and said, okay, um, I have, um, this is just a trigger that goes and um, repeats in an interval every one minute. Mm? And then it says, okay, please pull, pull out the Singapore weather for me and then just send it to the debug. So, and this one was one of the extensions that is, that is available for, for Node-RED. 
to uh, so you don't have to go okay um, I need to make a HTTP call to this and then get things back you can really encapsulate uh, functionality into these modules and this this one of the things I would like to show you there is red no red notes.org this is the registry where all the extensions for node red are published and the installation is really really complicated for most of the packages you just go to your j to your packages file and said i depend on this package and it will show up in your in your editor well, that's all this. so and then you see like so, so you see LDAP and MQTT and uh, AT&T MX2, uh, M2X, whatever that might be. So there are 14 pages of additional modules that can make your, like, say, interaction with the uh, with the Node-RED environment uh, much simpler. And last, last not least, where was it? Uh, this one. That's my little. There is the the thingbox.io. Um, and that is for the for our Raspberry Pi fans, ready-made images for the Pi One and the Pi, Pi Two, with the Node Red installation running on it. If you said, okay, I got my local little uh, uh, exercise running, I go and collect my data. For instance, using the uh, uh, the Bluetooth uh, devices, the punch through beans, I collect data locally, and then either I do from there HTTP post to the cloud or use the cloud and database, run it on the Pi, and then synchronize it back to the cloud, that's, that's up to you. So you then have, like say, a one, one level of environment where you very rapidly can uh, assemble your stuff. At the end of the day, the source code's all open. If you said, okay, I'm outgrowing the Node-RED stuff, you always can steal the, the, the source code, the, the, uh, the, the engine that uh, is running under the graphical UI uh, uh, that processes all the data. I was roughly, yep. so was that, uh, okay, now that, that was a block entry, that's not strange, about installing CouchDB on the Raspberry. We're gonna, um, you're gonna compile the links and put it on the site? You're gonna let, let me know all the links and I'll put it on the meetup.com. Okay. All right. Uh, so, so, recipes, sample sensors, no, node red this is local install and he has a light blue bean I said okay I want to read like say I want to whenever the acceleration kicks in please light up the bean as simple as that and then with the bean I just need to go and said okay uh, which of the beans is it and get the ID of the of the bean uh, in there whatever it's up and the Voila. And this as fast as it can go and, and program with this stuff. A little faster than the other stuff. Uh, you, then you can actually process and output it to uh, an HTTP post, right? Yep. Or yep. Okay. So that you can actually put it, all your data and all your processing can do it here. And you can post it to uh, you know your website. Yep. Right? I can do, let's say, I can go to HTTP and say, okay, up, up to HTTP, off you go. Or to MQ or WebSocket, or let's say I probably would today rather use a WebSocket than HTTP. Yeah. But up to you. And you can actually say, um, I also want to put that into a WebSocket. Oops. I want to put that into a WebSocket, and while I'm on it, uh, let me let me tweet it. <laughs> <laughs> of course, let's say uh, this. It's not magic, so you need to have, like, say, you need to have your. Uh, 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 Twitter credentials, so you authenticate with Twitter and said it, it posts on your behalf. Huh? So there's nothing, nothing irregular there. Can huh? you um, can you have a hierarchy of these or sort of decompose them? Yeah. So for particularly large, complicated things, you can make some yeah. yeah. So so you see here. I say you you saw that in, on the other side already. No, there. Here. So I use different pages. And then there is also the, the the latest one where we added is the ability to somewhere where is that subpage yeah subflows you say create a subflow then you have a subflow and just press the, the plus button at the side yeah that's that's a um, 
that's a, so that subflow can then be called by uh, oops, uh, an input, an output, and then I can go and uh, uh, call that subflow from one of my uh, one of my uh, main flows. I think it's now it should show up here. Where is it? Ah, uh, yeah, there you go. That's it. Okay, so it's subflow. And my weather source should go to the subflow first, and then from the subflow goes back to the output. Oh, I only model ten thousand sensors which are treated in the same or similar way. Then. <coughs> uh, so, <coughs> oh, when you when you go, that's that's an excellent question. If you go and look at the IBM IoT, let me just drag this one over. Shwoop. So um, you would not go and use the quick start. You use the API key. <coughs> and then in the API keys, you say, say okay, uh, you group, group them by types. For instance, I say you have 10,000 sensors, 5,000 temperature, 5,000 pressure. So then I said, okay, the device type, so, so you say temp XY, whatever you, uh, however they ad identify that. And then they said all of them. And then you collect them in one go. So you have some attributes and can sort of filter. And exactly. And that. So you got device ID, event type, you can say what format maybe some of the devices send JSON, some of them tend, tend plain, uh, send plain text. So you have you have this ability to to group them up, so you don't end up with ten thousand inputs. That would yeah. be a little bit silly. When I, when I deploy the sensors, then how do, does the sensor know about these attributes? Is it something that I've provided through the API or the that, configuration on the sensor? Name? Yeah, that's and that's one of the stuff. What's in what's in the what the libraries that we provide help you to configure. Mm -hmm. So what would I see in a practical way? Like so this idea that I have a single sensor that <laughs> straight away talks to the network. That's nice for for simple use cases. If you start deploying armies of sensors, you have a collection hierarchy. That's, that's very clear. And then you said, okay, maybe you have the, uh, a Raspberry talking to, to, your, uh, to the internet, and then you have a bunch of Arduinos talking to the Raspberry, and then you have the analog ports on your Arduinos then uh, uh, serving a bunch of sensors. So that, that's what would be a very typical hierarchy where you easily have a few hundred sensors which, which uh, end up with a single internet connection from, from, a, from a local aggregator like the Raspberry. Yeah, so this would be something I would provision when I deploy it before I deploy it or while I deploy the device. Yep, correct. Okay. okay. Any questions? More questions? Question. Um, so I understand you will save all the coding of the low level stuff. So you Blocks and, uh, still think that it loses all the fun of coding something, but, uh, but uh, uh, oh. you still have to code. You can go. To, you can go to the boilerplate. Say, sure. give give me give me go and then uh, IoT no. and. No, I totally agree. I totally agree with the approach. No, no. It's a, I understand that probably I can connect to it through. I can easily. I can see. I can create an API to connect to it. If I have to do a more complex logic. You know, based on let's say Python or Go, yeah. and I just connect it through an API. But there's no way to, uh, there's no way once I create this logic here to actually co connect na natively with it. Right? I mean, like, said to somehow, if I want to run this in the actual Raspberry Pi, and and in, in, and I want to create, I want to use all this logic without having to uh, to actually go out to Lumix or. or Okay. That one runs on oh, a Raspberry. This, one is, okay, this yeah. thing is you actually running. Okay, you okay. can run. So that, that, because uh, what I see there, that's not on the local machine, right? No, so, so this, this one is on Bluemix, and that one... Uh, oh, no. there you go. Okay, okay. That one is okay. on local. Okay, so okay. I, I have two installations. So, so I can have it running all locally yeah. and save all the, all the hassle of coming to create, to, to write all the low levels. Exactly. Yeah. But then I need two models. Yep. One for the, one for the Raspberry. It's not one model in there. Still need to have one model for the Raspberry. Well, it's, it's exactly. Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but you know, I, what, I, what I'm thinking is, uh, my background is in the auto industry, and what they sometimes do is they create models across different ECUs, and then say yeah. they deploy them afterwards, uh, say this one's here and this one's there. Actually, they're called uh, node packages. But so you, you can, you can the same node package with the same logic can run on, on two different devices. Mm -hmm. so, so what you do if you said, I want to have strongly reusable modules, you create one of this yourself. Yeah. And this is a, a very simple uh, uh, node package. Yeah. So even I could read the code. That is very interesting, but it's not what I meant. Yeah. What I meant is really that you have an end-to-end -end model. Mm -hmm. 
and can say this part of the model yeah. runs here and this part of the model yeah. runs there. You can do that. But well, that's the beauty so of yeah. yeah. so so how can you the push no, 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 no. how can you push updates no, to no, the code no runs in the co in the context of one node server. Yeah, exactly. yeah. So there's no yes. way to do it with scrolling. Yes, I you can't sit here and create in one node screen. Yes, you can. So yeah. you, you just need to make that one uh, leap of faith and I said a running node server is part of a bigger system. So you orchestrate that using using a, a, a set of APIs. I have a scenario. Uh, it might be what you That's just so uh, answered. Uh, so an, a node server by itself doesn't span across node servers. But nobody stops you that a node server goes and talks to an API to a fellow node server. So you can orchestrate that. So you so I can't build a model in one screen here yeah. that has pieces running on one node server and pieces running on another node server. That's right. That was the question. Yeah. But you, I see you you could do that and say so you model it in one screen, deploy it on both ends, and the ends know which part to run. So if I have mm. yeah, seventy yeah, Raspberry Pis in a huh? village, mm. it's not that's not the kind of thing that's being asked. The kind of the, the, it, for the for the concern is asking, he's not talking about tricking it. He's talking about no. okay. So you have a, a tool here that deals look, with one look. instance. Yes. I go. <laughs> yeah, one. The question is about a tool that deals with a deployed estate instance. Right. So you see, like I say, I got these four tabs in there. Yeah. I can t take this model and deploy it to all instances. So I have one model that de I deploy everywhere. But as, yeah, but as as long as I I, I use the input from only one, um, then uh, only that one page will run. If the other pages don't get any input, they won't pro process yeah. anyway. You're still answering a different question. This is close. What he's asking is close to the DevOps of question. Yeah, of course. Which this one? Would yeah, Node Red is not a DevOps tool. Yeah, that's right. So that was okay. That, but that was yeah, that question okay. is being asked. I think it's it's already really neat. So uh, um, yeah, yeah. So I have a scenario. If I deploy seventy uh, Raspberry Pis in a mesh in a village, mm -hmm. yeah, anyone or many of them can break down their connection to the internet. Mm. Can I still converge all the data <coughs> in this blue mix? Depends on how uh, you design I, I'm it. I'm not so user space uh, a programmer. Uh, yeah. uh, um, can okay. I convert? So, so there, there's two things that come to my mind. Yeah. Um, the first one is like say, MQ is designed to have a reliable message delivery. Uh, I would have a little bit, mm, how long can it work? How, how much buffer will it have before right. it breaks down? Uh, I probably, but that's, because I have a more background in databases than in networks, I would probably go and put a, a, um, a CouchDB on the Raspberry, because like say you, you put a 32 gig uh, a, a memory card in there, yeah. you can store a lot of data. And that one can say, okay, if I have a network connection, I do a, a synchronization, transmit the data, and if there's no network connection, it just collects the data locally. So with u using, a, using a CouchDB, you can do that, like say, the occasionally connected network. The occasion, no? Oh, That's basically right. the scenario described. So, so my, my, my thinking is in a place where yeah. the net can break down yeah. at any one point, I, but we can store and forward by meshing. I, I, can I, the data yeah. still be all converged? Yeah. I call that the occasionally connected network. Okay, we all know okay. the network is always available can, except can in the moment you need it. Yeah. Are you talking about the Raspberry Pi's as sources, or are you talking about them as concentrators for some Mesh. sensors? Either. <laughs> Either. They can so be the source of the information, or they can be collectors yeah. also. So, so the Raspberry sits there, collects yeah. its peripheral, but it also uh, takes in, like say, uh, the data from over there and gives it over there, uh, yeah. around there. But at the same time, you also need the storage, enough yeah. storage, yeah, yeah. right? So, yeah, uh, yeah I, I don't see a problem with that. It's just when it when when all the Raspberry Pis gets all the data. All right. Now the question, right, is where do you want to send it to? It how? <laughs> now that's the question. Right? Uh, whether this this um, modeling um, programming environment can support that kind of uh, store and forward um, messaging system. Uh. So this really is a case of the one configuration being deployed across multiple. So are, are you doing any processing to the uh, data? In the pipe, uh, maybe there, are, there, there uh, might be some pre processing of the data. Mm. Yeah. Because you, you don't want to send out all the data, right? You don't yeah, want to send yeah, out yeah. The, the unfiltered data, which is going to be like massive, a lot of information. Yeah, yeah. Right? So, what you want to do is probably you want to use this on the Raspberry Pi, each of them that's gathering the data in order to break down the data, analyze a little bit, 
I don't know, do something yeah, yeah, with some it. Pre-processing, right? like, pre-processing yeah. clean the data, make it a little bit smaller, maybe in the in the bytes. Yeah. Right? And then start sending out, right? <laughs> kilobytes. Kilobytes, yeah. Tens okay. of kilobytes. kilobytes. <laughs> right? Kilobytes, right? Rather yeah. than in the mag the, the max and the, the, the multiple max. I see right. the pictures yeah. coming. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. I think so, the, yep. it's my consultant. It's, it's very important. So I think what Stefan said is if you have a rough idea of what your connectivity yeah. is, yeah. I mean, that will limit how much data you can actually transmit. And that will decide how and small, how much you want to compress it or how much you want to process it. Yeah, it's just that the internet connection by any one of these Raspberry Pis might not be reliable. Yeah, one or many yeah. of but them. But also, yeah. what does it mean, not reliable? Does it mean, you know, is yeah. it 90%, 95%, is it 30%? It's 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 yeah. Or yeah. the occasional connectivity. Yeah, I think yeah. because if it's okay, so it's less of a problem. I'm not so sure yeah. I understand the concept because if you said that this internet connectivity, if this is IP transit, what, what makes, how, how do you mesh them in this IP okay. transit, right? Supposing I had a, ri- you, you a, a, a river, yeah? I had to deploy 70 Raspberry Pis along this river line. Right. So it's not yeah. an internet so, connection? Um, this is a, there are not many villages sort of with internet connection along this river line. How do you mesh them? I mean, the Raspberry Pis have one Store interface. and forward, I mean. If it's, if it's no. internet, if it's internet. I, I never mentioned Raspberry Pi. Oh, okay, sorry. I thought you said that. I thought you said that, sorry. I, I only use the word Raspberry Pi because oh, okay, they have okay. used it sorry, as a concentrator sorry. gateway. Okay. If you have a mesh, oh, then so what's, this so what's is a different mesh? story, right? Huh? So what's your mesh? Um, it'll be computers like the Raspberry Pi. Just so different what, computer. What, what, what kind of mesh network? Um, Wi-Fi. So, you uh, yeah, we oh, have 300 okay. meters, you know. Maybe, who knows? Sorry, I, I have a question. Okay. Okay. Sure. Okay, first, I'm sorry if I'm, I don't want to monopolize the question, but in your first, uh, in your first uh, part of the, of the session, you you show about um, a session of Python. You started with Python. Mm-hmm. Um, is it, I think somebody asked about whether the framework is in place or not. So I, uh, the question is, how do I get libraries into there? How do I get my <coughs> my libraries just actually to to be in there? So there's there's two parts to it. Like I said, the easiest one is um, the very moment you add it to the version control system, you like I said, you, uh, you clone the, the repository, pack everything you need in there, and so just I'll, deploy I'll it just, back. Uh, I, can, I can use it just as an standard repository. So I'll, yep. I'll write that on my on my own repository locally, Correct. push it, and then get it there. Yeah, uh, and then and then it will there is whatever a, I run there, yeah. it will pick it up from that repository. There is a little bit of a, a little bit more esoteric uh, uh, mechanism there in the documentation that a certain set of standard libraries you can define as dependencies, yeah. and then the, the 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 build process will add them to you. Um, the reason I ask is because it could be could be pretty dangerous, right? I mean, of course, if you don't sanitize that, right? That's this is this is a big big problem that probably you have. It's a challenge for you to sanitize whatever I put in there, right? <laughs> so, what what is it that? Um, so, what are you concerned in terms of the sanitization? No, it's uh, not my concern. I, I assume it will be your concern. Over usage of, of CPU or? Um, well, I, I, I assume it will be more of your concern than mine mm-hmm. in terms of the sanitation of what I what I put in there. I think you're, you're paying for the CPU time. What's, what no, you're not paying for CPU time. Right. Well, so so essentially how Bluemix yeah so essentially how Bluemix works right is you're only paying for memory usage of your instance. Okay, so CPU time networking you're not paying for it, right? We have a standard fair use. So to answer your question, there is a standard fair use. Okay. If you actually become a rogue application, so say for example your application starts using like lots of CPU, mm-hmm. start sending out lots of networking sure, and stuff sure. like that, we immediately shut it down. Okay. All right? So we, we do have an internal uh, uh, um, kind of mechanism in order to identify which one becomes rogue and we'll shut it down. So each app is a sandbox though. Sorry? Every application is sandbox. Every, yep. every application is a sandbox. So say for example, if if uh, there um, he didn't show you <laughs> in, the, uh, in the way below, that we actually have an experimental MySQL uh, server. So MySQL server, um, you cannot connect to the MySQL server except within the Bluemix platform. So everything is all sandbox. The only thing that's not sandbox is your API or whether your application that's exposed to HTTP port 80. Right? But all database connections and everything 
uh, unless it's a cloud service, right? Say for example, like Cloudin is a cloud service, uh, that that goes out into the cloud to a different uh, uh, um, you know cloud provider, which is um, under Bluemix too. Okay, under <coughs> under IBM also, right? Uh, so that's that's how it is, right? But everything that's like MySQL that's installed locally on the instance itself, it is uh, firewall within that uh, sandbox within that, that instance. Uh, it's the, the whole magic uh, under Cloud Foundry, yeah. where do isolation, yeah, isolation monitoring, uh, limiting instances. So they, it's, every little sandbox and has, uh, runs on a on a virtual CPU yes. basically, well, which is quite interesting. Because like say you then oh okay so how is it different from a container then yeah. because it's, it's <laughs> almost the same technology at the end. But, but I assume I have, I have a, a way to deploy that into if I if I decide to, to put that into run that on the, on into the a virtual so machine into yeah. a container or a virtual machine or yeah. something right. Sure. So I have sure. another choice and it's I will have to pay for that I assume. Um, yep. For what containers and virtual machines? Yeah, yep. that's that's yeah. Yes, that's separate. separate. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And they see what's what's interesting is when we started was Cloud Foundry only. And then uh, we realized that, let's say, the d distinction between infrastructure and platform is kind of an artificial one. Because, like, say, where does it stop? Where, do, where does it begin? Where does it stop? If I have a pre-configured container, that's almost as good as a, as a platform. So and that's one of the reasons that then, uh, we, only in January, we added the containers and the virtual machines. They're still in beta, mm -hmm. which is quite nice, because beta means we don't charge hey. for them yet. Um, and uh, so what what will happen over time i say i would say give it five years every single ibm software offering will be available as a service in bluemix including the a ability like say to to even provision bare, uh, bare metal uh, virtual servers what you today do in in ibm's infrastructure as a service offering uh soft layer and then so the the idea is to have a um a single interface where you can pick and choose all your uh, compute needs Hopefully it's not so depressing. What's that green brown? brown <laughs> <color>. <laughs> I think that I, I think one of the things is they're they're trying to change the color scheme and everything. So, so really, <laughs> when you yeah, sell, yeah, they are. It's in the when you sell blue mix, uh, is this a complete separate product from your infrastructure as a service? So it's soft it independent. Layer. It's, it's soft layer, right? So yeah. your infrastructure service soft layer back of it, and then they, so they're, they're yeah. two two, they're two different, two different offerings. Two different yeah. Okay. The funny thing is, like I say, when you when you buy a virtual machine on Bluemix, you can buy a virtual machine on Softlayer. You can buy a virtual right. machine on Bluemix, and the difference is where the bill comes from. Because right. okay. when we deploy a virtual machine in Bluemix, we deploy it in the so into the Softlayer infrastructure. So we make we call their APIs there, and this is why I say I tease my Softlayer colleagues and I said, you're you're Do you you're not? doomed. Because you're going to be blue mix in half a year. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so the next question there will be: Does blue mix allow me to use other APIs? Can I can I talk to Amazon API? Yes. Yes. Sure. Yes. Sure. So I can use blue mix to ask my ask my uh, foundry. Yeah. Any, anything anything yeah. that that goes through port eighty, you know, REST okay. REST APIs, everything, all of that stuff. It, it's all right. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And and the beauty of that is, uh, you're not paying for the network cost. Whereas, if you are having on the AWS, you actually pay for the network costs. No, but when so you say port, port 80, I mean, you, you still have to understand the API, uh, Amazon API, something on the back end of this. Is yes. This. So you already have built in API. Uh, for what? No. Nope. Let's say for Amazon. Let's nope. say no, no, nope. they are our competitors. No. We will not entertain okay, that. Them. Was <laughs> <laughs> but of course, okay. uh, there are sufficient libraries yeah, so from I mean, Amazon well, available. Okay, so if you tell me it's just it's just for it, and then I have to implement the whole API, then there's no point for me to well, use it. Well, I right? mean, Amazon has Amazon has APIs for all the different languages, right? Yeah. You no, can, no, you no, can no, get I'm your not job. Talking about, yeah. I'm, I'm talking about the infrastructure as a service. If I'm going to deploy something as a platform here, and I'm going to use the platform uh -huh. here, but I want this to run on an instance in Amazon, and oh, I want this, okay. I want this to have the back end, right? That's what I was saying. Yeah, okay, right. so so that's a, you need to sort, uh, and then we have to be a little bit more specific. You go to Amazon, you're talking about infrastructure. Right. This is platform. Yeah. Huh? Right. So. The, the, the overlay is so you said, okay, I can deploy containers into Amazon, I can uh, deploy containers into Bluemix. Yeah. Uh, you then have to go and say, okay, uh, you need to have the container deployable. Um, when you go and use the Amazon uh, platform as a service, so you, you have, what's that called, uh, the database? Uh, 
they're using Elastic Beanstalk. Document DB, no, that was Microsoft. Uh, um, uh, what? Simple storage? S3? Uh, simple no, no, the, the, so Elastic Beanstalk S3. would be the equivalent, but they are all proprietary APIs. They're not compatible to anything. Right, so, so, you know, I thought you had some sort of abstraction layer connector. Uh, yeah, so you, you had all your... your um, not yet. Your, not yet, okay. Not That's yet. not so going to happen. Is Amazon, is it, not going to happen. No, it doesn't have to be Amazon or not Amazon. Yeah. The, the, you know, yeah. forget about Amazon. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, say, let's say I'm I running in my data center, from. my own open stack. Oh, okay, so... I'm running my data center, my own open stack uh, thing. I don't want to go and implement if, all this. If it's open stack... You can deploy it. Dude, no, sorry, not yeah, sorry. sorry. Cloud, Cloud Foundry. Cloud Foundry. Sorry. Oh, okay. the guys, Cloud so Foundry. Amazon, <laughs> what, the problem is that Amazon won't implement. Let's. Uh, yeah. Let's. Not necessarily. I mean, Amazon provides the APIs. They're open APIs, right? So you, mm. as long as you implement the abstraction layer, you talk to the API, you can do it. You can launch. I'm running out of power. You can plug in now. You can plug in now. Implement Amazon And Amazon's not going to implement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Consequently, you have a permit. Just a question that I have. If one of the model is a bigger bone, if I have a hardware with the same Texas instrument, sure. I basically take that library, compile it, yeah, pretty much that. All right, so next up we have Nikolai, if it's saying Lay, I have no idea why, because it's LAY. LAY, yes. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Actually, I actually.